So thank you uh, for the preparation. I will continue my series of lectures on the on zero sum sequences, so the current title is so to say further results on the ten board constant, um, which well uh, I will also say something on the Erich Ginsburg Ziv constant, but uh, so mostly ten board constant. Uh, let me just say uh, a little thing in addition. Um, a compliment to the last lecture because uh, there was uh, a gap uh, in the sketch. So, well, it was a sketch anyway, but maybe I left a bit of a, <clears throat> in a search and a bit dangling without uh, explication. So, um, for the proof of the Chemnitz conjecture, at some point I, I used the lemma of the following form without stating it. So, let me just. Uh, Say this so let G be a B group. G be a B group. G in G. S is sequence. Sequence over G. And further. Let L and N such that two L is greater than G so and then one has that if the length of the sequence is two L and Sigma of S is 2G, then uh, 2 times the count of the, the alternating count of the sequences um, S is congruent to minus 1, L minus 1, and G, L, S. And uh, the two-dimensional version of this two times sum one l minus one minus one i n i two l minus one g g s is congruent minus one l minus one n l l g g s so, uh, so this was missing, and so this uh, this affirmation, and so uh, this is what gave us an inequality, uh, not an inequality, an equality by congruence, if you want, uh, if you prefer, that uh, was used at the start of the proof. So, um, I mean, it's not very difficult to see, uh, but maybe if I just just uh, just asserted it like this might leave uh, some confusion if somebody checks afterwards so how this argument is supposed to work. So this lemma should have been there too. So sorry about that. Uh, the, the proof of the lemma, once it's stated, it's not very hard because, I mean, there's a, the, the point is where does the two come from? One just, since the sum of the entire sequence is 2G, if we have a subsequence of lengths um, I, then the complement, uh, then there's a correspondence between the sequence and its complement. And if this, this subsequence has length g, then also the complement has uh, length g. Therefore, the count of the, uh, therefore the ni is equal to the nl minus i. And then I just group uh, those, uh, then I just group those together. This gives two. And then only the central term remains without the factor. And I know uh, that I already know that the count of all the sequences. So that this is that this is congruent to zero modulo p. So the sum of all the ni up to the length of the sequence is congruent to zero, and then I notice this uh, symmetry, and uh, I get it from there. So this just to uh, fill the gap in case somebody should uh, study the things in more detail. So then later. Uh, I started to talk about groups, so I, before I actually start, so I will just
just in this now. Uh, so, uh, so then I proceeded to discuss uh, groups uh, with uh, a very large. Uh, a relatively large exponent or a close, so to say, just a B group that is somehow similar to a group of rank two, um, and they add one cyclic component. And there it turned out that, uh, so recall the following situation. We had groups of the following form, recall. So we had something like uh, a group H plus CPK, CP to the K, and then I multiply it with some n here. So, uh, and the n can be arbitrary. So, I have a situation where I have a group H plus CPK, and uh, I have a cyclic group. So, I can build this group from two, these two parts, and this H is, somehow, is also a B group, but small in comparison to this. In particular, I had that the eta invariant of this, that this is less than, less than three times the, and this was actually important uh, to make the arguments work. Because then the idea was uh, I pass to a quotient group, I can pass to a quotient group, extract uh, lots of sequences there, and then, uh, Go uh, and then work in this in this cyclic uh, subgroup and put uh, everything together with the type of argument we already saw frequently, so called inductive method sometimes. So, um, but this only works well if the eta invariant is small. So let me before I continue to talk about groups where the Davenport constant can still be determined or some complements on the. Davenport constant. Um, there, I will make some remarks on what is known on the eta invariant and the S invariant for groups of large rank. And uh, in particular for groups of the form C to the N. Let's also. Maybe let me also remove this if it's just so to connect things together. It's not important to keep it. So S and, and eta for groups of the form C and R. And let's start somehow by increasing the n. So what about what about c2 to, to the r? So here it's really just a matter of uh, understanding uh, what the question even is, and the answer is more or less immediate. So I want to know how long a sequence do I have to take such that I find uh, for eta such that I find uh, at most uh, two elements whose sum is zero. So, uh, but I mean, find two elements whose sum is zero. There are just uh, two possibilities in, in this group. So either, uh, uh, either it's, uh, the, either I have the zero element, or I need to have the same element twice. So, uh, if I do not want to have the zero element, so what it's, uh, so I don't want to have the zero element, otherwise I'm done. So what can I do? I can take all the non-zero elements, so two to the r minus one elements, but then either I have to take zero or I have to repeat an element. So, uh, uh, so let's say it is easy to see that Eta of C to the, the R is 2 to the R. 
And uh, what about the S? So here I want length exactly equal to the exponent. And I mean, in some sense, this is even if the only way how two, here it's really the only way that two elements in this group can have some zero is that it's the same element, including the zero element. So I can take all the different elements, but as soon as there's a repetition, I have a subsequence whose length is zero. Oh, and uh, whose sum is zero and whose length is two. So uh, this is this. So that's, that was not too hard. And uh, what is interesting is that in some sense is that one can extend uh, this argument uh, to any group, uh, to any power of two. So it is also true, it is also true. It is also true that uh, it is, maybe it is also true, it's not good, it is, it is possible, it is possible, it is possible to obtain uh, eta of C to K, R and S, C, to the K R, but it's not in this case. It's not the it's not the order of the group, but it's something else. So, um, what could it be? Uh, how could we construct the lower bound? If you want to construct the lower bound. Uh, with the Davenport constant, it worked well uh, if we repeated some elements. So if we repeat just the basis elements, uh, we will arrive at the Davenport constant. But um, here, if we do not want any short zero sum subsequences or lengths exactly equal to the exponent, then uh, we can do the following. Uh, so lower bound. So the point is, um, if we, in all the coordinates, we only ever use zero or one, then if we want to uh, combine, uh, then if we want to get something which sums to zero, we will need at least n elements uh, to get zero in every coordinate, so to say that we started with one one. And so then the only way how things can work out is that if we have one element repeated n times, but let me write this in a more formal way. Okay, so lemma, we have either C and R is greater or equal than two to the power R minus one times n minus one plus one, and uh, for S, we have C and greater or equal r n minus 1 plus 1. So, uh, and this is true for any n, say n greater than 1. Yes, uh, the proof, proof, uh, let, so C and R, I write it as sum, I can one to R, E, I, like this. So with this basis element, so if you like, you can imagine it as one, zero, 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 one, zero, and so on, so it's basis vectors. And then I def I, what do I need? I need a sequence of these lengths which does not have a subsequence of some zero. So consider, Consider the sequence S, uh, uh, let's say, yes, let's consider the sequence S, which is given, uh, let's consider the sequence T, uh, given as by, so I take all the non empty, all, all the, excuse me, all the non empty subsets uh, R, and which elements do I take? I take the these elements. So this is a sequence of lengths two to the r minus one, and then I take say this and take so s equal to 
t to the n minus 1. So this means in the notation that I repeat each of these elements n minus 1 times. So the length of s is actually 2 to the r minus 1 times n minus 1. So that's this. And uh, yes, the point is consider this, 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 and and S has no subsequence of length less or equal than N with, with some zero. The argument is, uh, so I can look at each coordinate separately. And for each coordinate, I need at least n elements to have some zero. But uh, it cannot be n times the same element, because I only have to each one of them n minus 1 times. So it can never work out just using n elements, because there's uh, some imbalance somewhere. So maybe one has to think a bit about it, but this is the Example, and how does one do it for S? Well, it's always the same. So S is, I can always add something of the size exponent minus 1 to a sequence that has no subsequence that is short and they have not, no subsequent that has length exactly equal to the exponent of the group simply by uh, adding exponent minus 1 times, in this case, n minus 1 times the zero element. So this is the lower bound. So, and indeed for Groups uh, where n is a power of 2, or one has equality at this lower bound. Um, and there's a more general result along these lines, so upper bound, upper bound. So maybe I should add, so these results are uh, very classically, basically they, they go back to the start of these considerations, so one can al already find these results in the first paper of Harvard on this subject. Um, so upper bound for lemma is useful, so if, if eta of CMR is less than C, plus one and and s c n r is less or equal than less uh, excuse me c m c c n minus one plus one then No, uh, it's, 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 sorry, so it's for eta and for eta, but here it's with m and n, then eta of c and m r is less equal than c and m minus 1 plus 1 for n and c. Uh, but it, it doesn't really depend uh, on the C itself. So there's a, and same for S. Same for S. So there's a multiplicativity of the upper bound. If I have bounds for M and N, then I also get it for the problem. Note that there is no uh, condition that M and N uh, co prime minus. How does the proof go? Uh, yes, it's always inductive method. Uh, oops, I did the sketch, a brief one. Basically, one notes, one notes, one notes that C N M minus 1 plus 1, I can write it as Cn minus 1 times m plus Cm minus 1 plus 1. Is 
this right? Algebra should work out, yes. And so uh, I can always pass, I can, pa I can do this subgroup uh, construction, this subgroup consideration and uh, consider this sequence first projected to a quotient group of the form Cm to the R. And because of this, I can split off uh, Cn minus one sequence, subsequence of lengths m, and then still one more. So if Cn minus one plus one subsequences who have, a, who have lengths at most m, and lie in this subgroup, which is isomorphic to Cn to the R, then I can apply the other result. And then I get a sum of at most n elements, uh, which I then can replace by the sequences of lengths at most m. So that combined, this gives us a subsequence of lengths at most n times m. So this is something which is important here, so that also the uh, condition on the sequences, so they fit together. And consider, consider these usual things. Uh, uh, some C and R, which is a multi to some subgroup, which are in bed, which are in bed here, and then I project it with my C and M R modulo C. That's right. This, which then is R. And so, image, I get the subsequence, so I pull it back and uh, I combine these constants. So it's, it's, always the, it's always the same argument. So there's, in this case, it's also one case where it really works out nicely. This it is inductive argument. So uh, having this up and lower bound uh, together, it directly yields uh, the value here. Because, so I think this is the base case and things just fit together. It is possible to obtain a combining, combining, uh, combining upper, upper and lower bound, we get uh, that eta C2 to the K R is equal to two R minus one times two to the K minus one plus one and S of C2 to K to the R is equal to two to the R two K minus one plus one. So that's the situation, one is. So for elementary two groups and then um, C to K to the R, things worked really nicely. Um, but then already for three, the situation is very different and the problem becomes really uh, complicated. So, for C to K to R, everything is fine. But also, one point on which I want to insist is that the growth uh, with the, at the rank, uh, the dimension grows, uh, the constant grows uh, fast. So it grows exponentially in the rank. Uh, by contrast, uh, by contrast, the Davenport constant for the, in the P-group case, it grows linearly in the rank. So, which somehow, and in this inductive argument, we saw for these rank two-like groups, one needed uh, that the eta invariant of this uh, subgroup is not too large. So, one can already somehow see how there could be issues if the rank uh, of the group is too large. So if I fix the exponent, 
If I fix the exponent and let the rank grow, this is also here true, at least for the lower bounds, when it's an exponential growth. And uh, yeah. we won't discuss this here, but by now it appears that there are upper bounds, known, uh, upper bounds known that show that the growth is also not worse than exponential. Well, if the exponent is fixed, it was known since a long time that the growth is not worse than exponential. So it really, if one fixes the exponent, then if one fixes the end, then it's also it's not worse than exponential. Um, so now, uh, what about C3 to the R? So I'll remove everything. So the case of C3 to the R is, uh, in some sense, particularly popular. Because uh, so the one possibility is how can uh, uh, how can I have a subsequence of three elements that sum to zero? So if I have in C3R, so if I have, uh, if I have x plus y plus z is equal to 0, then uh, this is equivalent to x plus y, uh, x, maybe x plus z is equal to minus y, and so, but since we're in characteristic three, so that says uh, we have x plus z is equal to two y, and if you uh, recall, we already saw this equation frequently in other lectures. So this is just a characterization of arithmetic progressions of length three. So uh, still another way, uh, it would be uh, we could write z minus y is equal to y minus x, uh, however you want to write it. So uh, uh, x, y, z uh, are a three term a, b. So or, or equal if you do not want to include this in your definition of arithmetic progression of length three. So in this case, determining the S invariant is really equivalent to determining the cardinality of the larger set that has no three-term arithmetic progression. So the constants are not the constants are not literally the same because in the one case I allow repetitions and the scaling is different in that I want to assert the existence of a sequence, so I have to add one more. So, but the, the precise the precise relation would be that it's twice the cardinality of such a maximal set plus one, so, but there is an immediate relation between the two. And uh, also something which is interesting in this case, it's not hard to see uh, that uh, I can always repeat each element two times and it does not change anything, uh, whether they exist or doesn't, do not exist as zero sum subsequences of length three. So this is also interesting. So there is a, also a direct connection between the problem with and without repetition, which is not uh, always the case. And um, there's still uh, one more interpretation in this context of uh, C3 to the R. So in this case, um, one could also consider it in the following geometric way, uh, if one thinks about it, um, in this case, uh, arithmetic progression, one can write, if I have an arithmetic progression of length, of length three, then I can write it as x, x plus some difference, x plus twice this difference, but this is also, this, this set, this would be exactly uh, something like x plus D, D, where D, where D is an element of uh, 
let's say set module three set. So if one looks at it like this, and one and so and one considers this as this three i as a uh, vector space, vector space, vector space over set module three set, uh, the field with so the field with uh, the field with three elements. Uh, then uh, this is the equation of an affine line. So uh, three points are in arithmetic progression in this case, if and only if they form an affine line. So, so the, this would be a set uh, that contains uh, three points on a line. And this is also, so, sets that do contain or do not contain three points on a line uh, in a fin or also projective spaces. These are questions uh, considered by geometers, the context of discrete geometry, finite geometry uh, since a long time. And uh, if one really uh, traces the history, certain uh, of these questions on the cardinalities of these sets, uh, these constants first appeared in the context of geometry. So uh, people studied the question, okay, how can, which, which subset of this affine space is maximal with the property that there are no two points uh, on the line? So for instance, geometrically, what is such a shape? Uh, for instance, a circle usually. Is. So if I take a circle, there are no two points. Uh, no, yeah, did I say two? I, I want three. So I want no three points on a line. So for, if I have a circle, then there are no three points no three points of the circle are on one line. But I can take a sphere that it works in any dimension. So I have geometric shapes that have this property naturally. And then I can ask maybe if I take other configuration of points, there, there are more points that have this property. And then I can study what are the exact thresholds and how can I proceed. And people did this and found the values of these constants in this context, at least in the case of small dimension, because uh, it turns out that this problem uh, is quite uh, tricky. So, of course, we already um, heard about the uh, Ross theorem and so on, so we know uh, asserting existence of three terms arithmetic progression and the precise asymptotics related to this. This is a complicated problem. Um, but even in the case, if we have very small dimension, the, it becomes uh, really difficult to figure out the exact values. So. And the first thing that is, in, so there is this link uh, to three-term arithmetic progression. Maybe let me just mention one keyword because also in this context, so people really studied this, and this falls under finite field models. So uh, sometimes uh, rather than studying uh, the problem in the integers so or in uh, a cyclic group, People study it in these settings, in vector spaces over finite fields, because certain investigations are technically easier, but one still uh, sees uh, certain of these phenomena. So in particular, uh, Ben Green uh, popularized uh, this notion of finite field models, uh, this term of finite field models. So also <clears throat> in this context, these questions are studied. So, um, when are these uh, constants known exactly? So, well, of course, for one and two, it's known. So, we already saw it as C3. So, this is, so this is, uh, this is two times, I write it in a bit of a strange way. So, like this, okay, and then we have S squared. So, this is four to the R minus one plus one. And then uh, here, Maybe the first surprise, so this is 9 times 3 minus 1, plus 1. So it does, contrary to the case of elementary two groups and the lower bound, where the coefficients uh, were 2 to the 1, 2 squared, 2 to the power 3, so one would expect, so naively one would expect, would expect 8 here. So the standard lower bound gives 8, but the exact value is 9. And then it continues, and four, and then one is kind of maybe at, at the loss, what could one expect? Uh, uh, four, nine, maybe these are the squares, but that's not the case either, because here it's 
it's 20, and then uh, it's 45, is it? Yes, and then to uh, 112 feet. So that's what is now. And I, I hope I got them right and did not, and I'm not shifted by one because depending on where one looks, one gets this, the things differently. But the, it's five and then twice the last one. Six, yes, six, yes, yes, yes. So it's known up to here, and then well, as C three to the seven, this is open. And uh, in particular, so this result is fairly recent. So it's not very recent by now anymore, but it's uh, maybe a decade old or something like this. I can't change. So this and this result here, these are very classical. And this was done at some time in between. These uh, questions can be looked at using computer. Uh, yes, uh, in principle, uh, in particular, the smaller cases by now, they are definitely amenable uh, to direct search. But uh, for instance, this, uh, this, uh, this value here, the exact value was not known uh, for quite some time uh, and uh, until a decade ago, and there were people that did computations on this, but they, it, it did not work out. So, th so this year, uh, was too large for a computational treatment until the point when it was solved maybe 10, 12 years ago uh, and with an argument that did not uh, involve any um, extensive computations, if I recall correctly. But it's, a, a, it's an elegant uh, counting argument that uh, yields the result. So this is due to, if I, I think the name of the person who proved it is uh, Potechin. Um, so one can compute on this, uh, but um, this already is too large, so to say, for for direct um, computation. And uh, so until here, one has exact value. So what's with the lower? What's with bounds? Having these bounds here and having one step, so to say, above two to the power three, one can also, uh, not two to the power three, maybe the power of two in, of the corresponding dimension, one can also see that one can recombine, uh, so to say, these constructions to get uh, constructions whose cardinality will exceed uh, two to the power r that will grow like a constant that is strictly larger than two to the power r. Uh, in any dimension, because one can somehow recombine uh, the constructions in a given dimension to have a construction in the multiple uh, of in a multiple of this dimension, and so uh, one can show there exists a constant uh, c strictly greater than two, such that such that, such that S uh, C three to the R is greater than C to the R. So, uh, let me at this uh, for safety. Uh, for the next thing I will say, and uh, so this is known, and uh, it's known we see uh, about uh, 17, so 2 comma 2 17, and if I recall correctly, this is due to if it is bound. And then what is uh, about upper bounds? And here, this is a very a, a rather recent result, so from a few years ago, I think it appeared 2017, which, caused, uh, which was 
very much noticed at that point because it was an open question for quite some time. Yet also there is an upper bound, let's call this CL, and there's also an upper bound uh, which is exponential but with a constant, with a constant, with a constant that is, that is strictly smaller than 3. For our um, RC. So the constant here is, uh, one, has, so one has an exponential saving on the uh, cardinality of the group. And this, it was not clear whether, whether this would be true. Because before this bound, one had other bounds, but there one only gained uh, a, a factor that was uh, logarithmic in the order of the group, or then in, uh, a power of the order, the logarithm of the order group, but not an exponential uh, saving. So it was um, very interesting that this is true in this context, and one has a considerably better upper bound on three times arithmetic progression in this finite field setting than in the case of cyclic groups or the integers. And this result is uh, due to, uh, so this was uh, 2017, Eilenberg, uh, Eilenberg, excuse me, Eilenberg, Eilenberg, not Eilenberg, um, and here is a, uh, and a crucial tool, a crucial tool, crucial tool is a, is a polynomial, a polynomial, polynomial method uh, developed by, method by uh, Code, Code, Lev, and Bach. So for, uh, for C4 to the R. So, so they, uh, studied the problem for C4 to the R and developed a method which then turned out to be also applicable in this case. And so this so this is the situation and what's the what's the value of the constant here? Uh, the value of the constant here is uh, to Seven, uh, five, six, five, six. Maybe there is an improvement by now, but uh, something like this. So there is some, there is some gap, but it's not quite clear where the truth will be. But it was uh, at that time. Um, it was before that result. It was not even clear if it would be possible at all to have such a bound. There were even doubts that it would be true. And so it's, so this is the situation for elementary three groups. So uh, what else uh, can one say uh, on these constants? Uh, now we have elementary three groups. Uh, can we also continue from there? Uh, to powers of three, for instance. I mean, uh, we get upper bounds of this form. So our multiplicativity lemma, we can, uh, we can use it. And here we get directly an upper bound of the form nine times uh, three to the k minus one plus one. So this works. I mean, it works, it works for any constant, whatever dimension works all the time. But the, the problem is, uh, can I get the matching lower bound? And, uh, the answer to this is yes, and uh, this was discovered uh, maybe not quite 20 years ago, but almost by uh, Christian Elsholtz. So uh, this was known, but uh, for the, this case, but in the case of uh, other and uh, it, no other constructions were known. One had the standard construction and uh, that they recalled above and uh, nothing beyond that. And uh, he investigated this problem and uh, what he was able to show is that actually one all, has all the time uh, this uh, type of lower bound. 
And what do I mean by this uh, type of lower bound? So as a result, uh, L sorts, L sorts, lower bound. So for odd n s c n to the power three is greater or equal to nine n minus one plus one and eight eight n minus one. The end one really needs a uh, Maybe that one does not need n, but at least it one needs some restriction on n because for powers of two it definitely does not hold. But for any odd value it does. And um, so this is this, and then for for r equal to four, this was done uh, by by Edel, uh, also L sorts. Also, it's Geraldinger, uh, Geraldinger, uh, uh, Kubertin, Reckin. Um, they did this uh, for dimension, so they lifted uh, this for dimension four. Twenty n minus one plus one, and always the same for eta. So we do this. And, uh, and I, I don't want to uh, delve into all the details regarding this lower bound construction, but then it's uh, curious that for the next case, uh, so for dimension five, so they managed to lift uh, this construction and they managed to lift this construction. But here in dimension five, uh, there's a problem. So far, nobody managed to lift uh, this, this uh, construction, but uh, they managed, they, in this case, being only able uh, if I recall correctly, for a value that is slightly smaller, but it gives still something better than, uh, which is relatively larger than the 20 here, maybe it's uh, 41 or 42 or something like this, which he can lift. But he cannot, um, he cannot, uh, he could not uh, get a bound that really matches the situation in the three case for other values. So uh, maybe it is also not, uh, it's, Maybe it's also the truth. So, uh, but in the in the case of dimension five, uh, the bound for three, uh, the exact value for three is better than the general lower bound. Whereas in the dimension up to four, it's the same. And the, it's it's somewhat plausible. There is, so he has so evil. He really comes from this geometric context, and he has some explanations, geometric explanations, why it actually might be the case that this the things start to diverge. So, so to say, the construction, uh, there is a geometric form, so to say, in this dimension, which is somewhat smaller but than the maximal one, but also, uh, so to say, geometrically significant, and this one gives rise to a general construction, whereas this maximal one does not. So there is some, there could be some reasons why uh, this is the case, but I do not, uh, fully know this, but so this just is a passing remark. Um, so, but up to dimension four, one has these um, bounds. And now uh, one might ask, well, uh, so one has these bounds, okay, but uh, I mean, are they true? Uh, do they give the true value? Because I mean, it could also be larger uh, in for, for, for um, other values than three, because I mean, uh, so we had two, now we have three. I mean, why shouldn't it be maybe still larger for five? I mean, there's no clear reason why it should not, uh, but it turns out it is not. And here it, it seems even maybe that three is the worst case possibly. So uh, something is known related to this. And this something is, um, Something is not related to this. So uh, exact values are rare in this context. The fourth case, you cannot use the field vector space vector of closure. Yeah. yeah. 
I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, okay. Um, in some cases, uh, the exact value is known. So, this is, this is, uh, one has, uh, so for five, it's known. Uh, it's actually nine to the five minus one plus one. So maybe I should say, so this is uh, and some time ago. So this and uh, so for five, uh, one has the actual, so it matches the lower bound, uh, this lower bound here for five. And uh, I said odd here, and so it's, one knows for two it's different, but also for six it's actually different, so it's eight to the six minus one plus one. And then also a consequence of this is consequence. Consequence, one has actually S, C, three to the, three to the A, five to the B, three, so this is, Nine. Okay, let let me write it like this: for for n equal to three to the a, five to the b. One has uh, c and three. This is one plus one. And uh, for for n equal to six to the a, two to the b. One has that uh, s c n to the three is equal to eight n minus one. One. So maybe that's a bit unusual to write it like this. Uh, I could also say that uh, I could also write it as uh, two to the power a, three, three to the power b, and insist that the power of two is at least as large as that of the three. But uh, one needs actually uh, one cannot have too many threes because I mean here to get this, I mean this is immediate uh, from the multiplicative bound with with uh, c equal to nine, but here, if I want to use this multiplicative bound, I can use it, uh, I can use it uh, for six, I can use it for six, I can use it for six, and I can also use it for two, but I cannot use it uh, for three, because for three, uh, it's nine, and uh, it works for any constant, but it, it has to always be the same constant. So uh, I can use it for six and for two, so I can I get numbers of this form. So, for instance, I get it for, for yes, of course, for six and for thirty-six, so, but also for twelve, but uh, not for eighteen. I, I don't know. Uh, Likely, it's also true for eighteen, but uh, we do not know. And uh, there is actually a conjecture, uh, conjecture, conjecture, which is due to uh, uh, Gao and uh, Gao and Tang Rai. Which says that uh, it actually so that this is uh, nine n minus one plus one uh, eight n minus one plus one for n odd and n even. So there might be a parity uh, phenomenon here. So, uh, so this is the situation for groups of the form C n to the power r, and uh, I mean one could also uh, consider questions like this for for other types of groups. Uh, I mean, why just uh, why just uh, groups of this form? One can also study them for. Other groups of rank three uh, where the exponents uh, are not, where the cyclic uh, components do not have, all have the same size, and one can also um, obtain results in this uh, context, but they are a lot more limited. But maybe let me uh, 
a recent, let me add one recent result, recent result with, um, recent result with uh, Benjamin Gerard and myself. Uh, we proved, so the S of the group C2 plus C2N1 plus C2N2 to N1 divides N2. Uh, this is, uh, let me be careful because uh, I wrote it down for the eta invariant, so I need to mentally add something, and so I might, uh, I might, uh, so it's 4N1 plus, 4N1 plus 4N2 minus 1. If n1 is not equal to n2, and it's uh, it's 8n2 plus 1 if n1 is equal to n2, and this uh, at least at least at, uh, for for all n1 that have Property, property D, but uh, well, so presumably these are actually all integers. Uh, I did not say what property D is. Uh, I might come back to this in another lecture, but let's say so. This is a technical condition, uh, but typically, so this should be uh, the correct value uh, all the time. And uh, actually, for eta, so this is the situation for S and for eta, for eta, uh, for eta. Uh, it's 2n2, two two. so it, for eta it's 4n1 plus 2n2, two two, so the difference is always exponent minus 1, and here it's 6n2 uh, two plus 2. So this is for eta, and for eta, uh, for eta we do not have, we do not need any condition. Because uh, actually the analog of property D for eta, which was known for some time as property C, uh, is by now known for any uh, n1, so it's not a real condition anymore. So you see, uh, also for other groups of rank three, one has uh, some results, but I mean it's rather uh, limited. So we need to fix uh, the smallest one to be two, then it's not so. For three, it's not known. Uh, also, yes, um, and there, I should also add. So there were preliminary uh, precursory results where it was for one. So where C two, C two, C two, uh, n. Uh, also, the the two larger ones being equal. This was actually also known. So this this result, actually, the case of equality was already known beforehand, at least implicitly. Uh, but uh, so to say in this one, it's a recent result which appeared last year and the year before. So uh, maybe uh, with this result, let me stop uh, this lecture here. And uh, I'll go back in the next lecture again to groups of this form. But for the Davenport constant, uh, for the Davenport constant, just C2 plus C2 plus C2n. And we will study the Davenport constant for this group, and then we will also see more or less the same methods that are used uh, to obtain this result. But this will happen uh, tomorrow. So thank you for your attention.